This is a production of Cornell University. First, just let me um, say it's no accident that I'm following Victor. You know, we have the same interests on emergence. We have the same networks is basically uh, the, the, the solution. We basically are committed, both of us, to multi-method uh, sort of approaches to networks. And he's, you know, rooted in one field and now branching out. I didn't even know about New York. And I'm also rooted in one field, Renaissance Florence, sort of branching out. So I have a tr we have a lot of uh, things in common and hopefully a lot of uh, mutual admiration. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about Renaissance Florence. Uh, I'm sort of tired of talking about it, I guess. You, know? <laughs> you go read, read. I have plenty you know, printed <clears throat> about the subject. I'm going to basically be focusing on what I think is the general themes in this uh, sort of book that Woody and I uh, wrote. But I can't help uh, saying one thing in response to uh, Victor about Renaissance Florence. He, he emphasized the, the role of reputation, the role of you know, gossip, the role of, you know, this, this sort of thing. And the, your capital was your name and this sort of thing. You know, Cosimo de' Medici's bank, uh, and actually was in brother, he had a brother named Lorenzo, not the famous one, but another sort of Lorenzo brother. You know, um, it was the biggest bank in Europe, not just Florence, in the entire Europe. And, uh, you know, how much investment, you know, in the sense of corpo, how much of his own cash he put into this? So, not because, he didn't have it. not because he didn't have it. So, if you want to measure leverage, you know, indebtedness divided by, uh, you know, corp capital, you know, it's a leverage of infinity because his denominator is zero. And uh, the reason, of course, is what Victor is talking about. He had a name, he had connections, he could get into trouble and he could snap his fingers and money would pour uh, down upon him, you know, which he could then use and he could do. So, you know, Renaissance Florence looks a lot like. China, actually, you know, and there's no state there. I mean, of course, you could talk, you could talk about a state, but you know, really, it's it's really light on the ground in terms of its influence. So, uh, that's just I'll just throw that out. That uh, I I agree with uh, Francesca. The word universal makes me nervous too. But similarity, you, you go along with similarity. There are some similarities, you know, between Renaissance Florence and China and these sort of places. Okay, so what I want to talk about instead is a sort of a, the overall uh, book that Woody and I wrote, and I, this is what the book looks like. It looks better color than that. Um, but the reason I put the picture up... The side view is more impressive. Huh? <laughs> yeah. You said the side view is more impressive. Yeah, very, very big book, a long book, heavy <laughs> book. Um, but the reason I put this slide up, uh, th this is the real color of the book, you know, <laughs> or blue-green, is, is this, uh, you know, th this looks like, you know, maybe it's just a bunch of rocks, maybe it's a modern... Uh, abstract painting or something, but what it really is is the, uh, the origins of life on Earth. That's the oldest fossil that exists uh, in the history. You know, it's called stromatolites. It's basically bacterial colonies, and bacterial colonies uh, completely uh, surrounded the ocean, lived in the ocean, and were all, all over. And they, they were so massive that they are there what created the uh, oxygen in the atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, and so forth. So this is a huge thing. Now the reason I, I mention this is the following factoid which got me into this whole project in the first place. It, which is that the Earth is, uh, you know, look up the details on my paper, but, but my, the Earth is 4.9 or 4.5 billion years old. And these fossils are, I think, 3.9 billion years old. You know, and the first billion years, you know, the, the, the Earth was not even, didn't even have water. It was just bubbling lava and so forth. And all. So the point is, basically as soon as the Earth cooled off enough for there to be water, there was life. Like, immediate. If you think life was this sort of gradual flipping of coins, uh, this is emergence, the biggest emergence uh, ever, you know, just almost instantaneous. I like to say, well, the creationists might have their explanation wrong, but they got their facts right. You know, <laughs> on the seventh day, boom, it was done, and that's it. You know, it's just, it's just, just clear. So, uh, life emerged immediately, basically. You know, and this is uh, 
uh, a puzzle that I, I'm going to use as a sort of a metaphor, of course, for all sorts of transformations. All sorts of transformations are pretty sudden and pretty quick and spread pretty fast. And they all have this sort of property that Duncan was pointing to, that they, they usually har are hardly ever created for the reasons that they turn into being used. You know, there, something's happening, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, you know? And, and this, is, this is a typical profile of all the cases I look at. Almost never are these life-changing, organizational changing things I'm described intended. After the fact, they're intended, you know, but at the origins, and I don't mean they weren't, I don't mean they were, people are non-purposeful agents. I just mean people have purposes here, and then their effects are over here. And then this is what takes off. That's what I mean. Just like what Duncan uh, sort of described. That's going to be a typical uh, trope in what I say. Content of the books, I'm gonna, obviously I'm not going to go through this, but there's a section on autocatalysis, which is this, uh, the model uh, that people have come up with about this formation of the stromatolites. Uh, this is the scientific answer for why life sort of emerged so quickly, and I have models in here. Um, there's the history side of me, which is, of course, Florence and Italy, but early capitalism, state formation, uh, the emergence of international banking, this partnership system thing that I mentioned with Francesca in Renaissance Florence and Italy, uh, the emergence of a stock market in early modern, in early modern Amsterdam, the, the consolidation of Germany under Bismarck of, out of all of these provinces, the, <clears throat> the topic that actually a little earlier than but the topic that uh, Victor was talking about, the politics of economic reform in the Soviet Union and China. This is my part of the book. And then other people have done uh, various other aspects of the communist transition. And my co-author, Woody Powell, is mainly uh, doing all this stuff about Silicon Valley and biotechnology. It's a, it's a ridiculous array of topics from the origin of life to Silicon Valley. But you know what, what links them is uh, these are all cases I claim of the emergence of novelty, the emergence of a new form of life. You know, and wh what I mean by a new form of life is a novel organizational form that didn't exist before, like the stock market. You know, I say, I emphasize novelty, 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 novelty. You know, now I'm aware, you know, this historian's, uh, Francesca's friend and mine, Richard Goldthwaite, oh, no, 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 nothing's ever novel, nothing's ever novel, oh, don't, what about this, what about this, what about this, you know, endless, I, you can look on my webpage, 60 single page correspondence with me and Richard about the definition of novelty, you know, and it's hardly ever that there was no precedent, there's no such thing as virgin birth, but what it is, is new combinations, things that have a history individually, but they were put together in a new way that then become you know, reinforcing these positive growth uh, sort of sort of kicks in. So I don't mean novelty in the sense of out of nowhere. I just mean new combinations that really uh, sort of ex exploded. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about this idea of the origin of life and what that can, how that can be operationalized, implemented. How you can think about it on these more social emergence questions, like the type of thing that uh, Victor just talked about. Okay, so I'm just sort of a general theoretical overview. And then if you want to ask me about cases, of course, I could talk endlessly about cases. Um, what are the goals of the book? Uh, the main thing, uh, it's trying to do two things. Uh, understand processes of novelty, especially organizational novelty, the creation of new types of organizational forms. But that's, in a way, just a subset of what I really care about, which is the emergence of actors, you know, at, both at the individual level and at the organization level. Um, and I'll come back and say this, this sort of question. And then I'm also going to say something about uh, evolution from a different point of view. So let me say first a point about this, and then a point about this just at the goal level. Novelty, I just want to submit, uh, is a hard problem. Um, first of all, uh, Darwin wrote a book called The Origins of Species. Changed the, you know, very famous book. You've heard of it. Um, but of course, he never explained the origin of species. He explained natural selection, given that they originated. Uh, he didn't actually answer his uh, sort of topic. The whole question of speciation was not really uh, uh, settled uh, in the Darwin case, even though that was his goal, that was his uh, sort of purpose. Um, so it's, it's a hard uh, sort of question, and it's also hard for another reason that in the social sciences, the word novelty, you know, it's not novel if people knew about it ahead of time. So by definition, People have a certain awareness or consciousness and novelty to be true novelty is something that's out here that people have not had an experience of. So, you know, the whole approach of 
uh, consciousness is really not actually very helpful because, in fact, this is something that's happening outside. You know, they're thinking, it's not that they're blind, they're thinking this, but then this happens and this is the emergence, not, not, not this. So it's a hard problem. And it's a hard problem also because, uh, you know, a dominant approach in social sciences, as has been made uh, clear all afternoon, is methodological individualism. And uh, methodological individualism, of course, proceeds from a premise. The axioms are individuals are the basic foundation, and then from individuals, then we derive uh, consequences, you know. And Coleman's boat, which you put up, was down, over, up, but all of the action that in the, in the methodological individual church is this up part. There's never much focus on the down part, you know, about career construction of the actors individually. Not that that's not important, but they, they emerge off stage from the theory, let there be the following set of preferences, let there be the following set of this, then we can do magic about collective action and so forth. But the basic axioms uh, come off stage. So if you want to complete the Coleman boat of trying to derive uh, where actors come from, you know, you're confronted with this novelty question in which base, I would say, we don't really have many tools. That's why I'm going to wind up turning to biochemistry because that's where a lot of work has been done, the, the question of speciation, you know, a lot of work has been done since Darwin on this type of question. So all I'm trying to say is uh, this is an issue. Now, if you ask, well, how do you proceed? Well, I, I was, again, a second metaphor. I'm, I like... Uh, Metaphors, actually, you know, but if I, I, I proceed by just thinking about me, I'm here, John Paget, and I look like I have preferences, for sure. I have resources, not as much as I want, but some, something. You know, I have, I have a definite worldview. I have a lot of features, which uh, there's no problem that I'm a methodological individual. But if you look at me like a chemist would look at me, you know, you get a very different flavor. You know, what, what, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuff coming in. I'm stuff going around, I'm stuff going out. Next day, there's more coming in, stuff going around. You know, this 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 process of uh, I like to say, look at your nose. You know, do you realize that your nose wasn't there two years ago? <laughs> that is to say, there isn't a single atom or single cell that was there two years ago. Why? Because it's all it's all died and it's been flushed and it's been reconstructed. You know, so the whole process of us stability through time is this reproductive process of chemicals. I'm a chemical reaction network that reproduces itself through time with inputs and outputs. I'm not as solid as I look. I'm just a little vortex, you know, that's eventually going to run out of gas. You know, and, and this, is a, this is who we, how I am as a chemist. And so I'm saying, well, we should think about our social structure this way. We, shouldn't, we should think about social structure not as Cornell University or something, but no, no, people are coming in, people are interacting, people are going through, and there's, you know, there's something about Cornell that sort of persists through time, but actually it's all flux at the micro level, you know, and so the question is, what is the mechanism of flux and reproduction that keeps me or the Un Cornell University or any of the things going through time? I think this is going to be the, uh, the micro foundations of, of understanding emergence. You have to get rid of the word object solid object and talk about flows, trans re reproductive flows. Now, before I get carried away with this, I w I'm always want to say the most uh, important sentence that's quoted in our book, which I agree is important. We say, uh, Woody and I say, in the short run, actors make relations. That's methodological individualism, if you didn't get it. You know? <laughs> but in the long run, relations make actors. You know, so, so the, the conflict between methodological individualism and social constructivism is really a question of time scale. It's a question of intercalating time scale. You know, in the short run, given that I am who I am, you don't need to worry about where I came from. But if you are concerned about longer time scales, you know, well then, you know, actually my mother was, was rather important and Harrison White was sort of important and all these things, all these relationships that I have gone through have made me through time. So if you add that to your time scale, then this second half in the long run relations create actors has becomes very important. I think each of the, these two sides are equally important. It's just that social science spends all of its time on the first half. It doesn't spend any of its time on the second half. And that's basically what I'm trying to bring to the table with this uh, autocatalysis uh, sort of point of view. The second point about is evolution. Um, this is something I learned uh, down my friend Iris, uh, Walter Fontana that I cited earlier in the day. 
Um, evolution really isn't really, you know, they're not really at the, the, population genetics is still important, but you know, that's not where the action is in evolutionary theory anymore. Population genetics, if you don't realize, you know, there is a, a set of genes which are selected. It's a marriage of Darwin and Mendel. So you have natural selection up here. You have a pile of genes over here. The, the modern synthesis, so-called, pop, namely population genetics, is all about how this selection affects the distribution population uh, of the genes. This is sort of standard uh, evolutionary type of theory, but that's not really where the action is and why. Because there's this middle level called the, the phenotype. Not the genotype, but the phenotype, the, the actual critter. You know, that's sort of carrying these through. That that level has been eliminated in the pop in the modern synthesis. And today, I would say there's a new school called Evo Devo, which is all about how you get from genes to phenotype, the process of development, evolutionary development. The development refers to phenotypical development, uh, to turning these genes into a sort of thing. And why do I digress like that? I digress like that because it's all about networks. That's why. It's all about networks. It's not about Evo Devo is not all about, it's not all about distributions of genes, it's about the interaction, the sequencing, you know, the regulation, turning on and off the expression of genes through time. That's where, that's how noses happen and all of this sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, I'll get another factoid, you know, uh, nobody guessed that the number of genes in the, in the uh, Human Genome Project was as low as it was. You know, there was a, there was a pool. A biologist, what's the number going to turn out? It turned out to be 20,000 20, or so, 22,000. That's lower than any biologist predicted. Lowest, I mean, we're not, and we don't have any more genes than Drosophila. Now, they have about maybe a few more genes, but not, basically not many more genes than Drosophila. It doesn't mean the chromosome, our chromosome is much bigger, but the number of genes in it, it's not any bigger. Why is it so much bigger? Well, it's all about regulation. It's all about communication. It's all about networks. How does this gene turn on and off these types of networks? That's the process of development, is a process of, of development of the networks among a relatively fixed uh, sort of number of genes. That's Evo Devo. That's, if you see that, then I think, well, we're, us social scientists are in that same game. You know, we, we can definitely talk about the evolution of networks. We can try to. We can, we can talk about these sorts of things. We are part of Reconceptualize, reconceptualizing evolutionary theory away from population genetics towards uh, sort of Evo Devo. So this is, I, I'm an I'm alliance with a lot of uh, people in biology and now I have a new social science research council program, History, Networks and Evolution, which is supposed to institutionalize this alliance with biologists and uh, social scientists. Okay, so that's the big picture. Um, how do you go about implementing this big picture? Well, here are my two axioms. You know, I, I said, well, methodological individualism has the axiom of actors, and that's bad if you want to study emergence. On the other hand, every theory has axioms. It's not like I don't have axioms, you know. I, I have, so, you know, these are my axioms, autocatalysis and multiple networks. Uh, Santa Fe Institute, uh, Harrison White. So let me, my talk is just basically to explain those two mechanisms, or two, maybe mechanism, I, I like the word mechanism, but it's a little bit too engineering for Francesca. You know, maybe processes, two, pro, two processes uh, rep that go through time that ha will answer, I, I claim, the question of uh, novelty and emergence. Okay, this is my claim. You can get it out of these two. You have to have both, though. One alone is not enough. You have to have both to, to get uh, novelty at the end of the day. So what is autocatalysis? Autocatalysis is... Uh, is an idea that basically was formalized by uh, Eigen and Schuster, uh, Austrian and Germans, and Eigen got the Nobel Prize in 1977, so this is not cutting edge stuff, it's stuff that's well recognized in the past, you know. But it's basically, to oversimplify, and I make it more complicated in my chapter two, but to oversimplify, this is the chemical definition of life. A set of nodes and transformations in which all nodes are constructed by transformations in the set, you know. Um, now that seems, what the hell is he talking about? Well, to talk about chemistry. A set of chemicals and chemical transformations or chemical reactions. A set of chemicals and chemical reactions in which chemi all chemicals are constructed by chemical relations among chemicals in the set. You know, so you have a, a, a set of chemicals, but they're not they are produced internally. You know, this chemical relates with this chemical, which turns into this chemical, which is chemical, but eventually you come back to the beginning and reconstruct the, uh, 
the, the, the relationship. You know, in, in, so it's basically a positive feedback loop. It's a positive feedback loop, which every node is, is, is the recipient of a positive feedback. So why did the origin of life happen so quickly? Well, it happened so quickly because of autocatalysis. Namely, you throw in a bunch of chemicals and then nothing happens, boop, 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 linear, but linear, boop, linear, boop. You get cycles, though. You know, and this thing sort of uh, emerges like this. So these positive feedback loops of construction are really uh, the secret. They're the basic material of which life is, is involved. Now there are other things called inheritance and so forth, with genetics, you know, the other things come down the road. But at the beginning of the story, it's really all about uh, autocatalysis. So I just mentioned that. And like I said, that's not my idea. That's Eigen and Schuster. Um, but you know what Woody and I do is we say, hey, that, that works for social systems. Nobody thinks it. Why not? You know, what is an economy? Well, economy is a set of products and production rules, like technological things, in which all the products are constructed by production rules that relate products in the set. You know, you take this product, you turn it into that product. It's like thinking of an, an economy like an ecology. Take this, add this, turn it into a car. You know, take this, add this, turn it into this. Turn it, you know, and the point of view is if, if it's cyclical, if it's just linear, then that's not self-reproducing. You make cars, but you don't keep the whole economy uh, going. You have to have the cycles. And what's the cycle? Well, you, you say, well, oil, it's not, we didn't make oil. Yeah, but we made the machinery that got, got the oil out of the system. So there's always this sort of constant process of generating inputs into you to keep yourself sort of going. So an economy is a living system. Not usually thought of that. It's usually thought of a price generating market. But if you think of it as an ecology, the economy is a living form. If this is the definition of life, then it is, you know. Okay, well, social networks are like that. People, I just gave the example, I'm here I am because of a concatenation of social relationships through time. If you take a long enough time perspective, well, where did my mother come from? Where did she come from? Where did, blah, blah, blah. you know, they're, they're all sort of uh, reproducing itself through time. So a set of people and social relations in which the people are constructed over time, of course, through social relations among people in a set. So a social network is actually a living form, if you think of it in this dynamic, over time sort of way, rather than just a snapshot uh, sort of cross-section. And even language, uh, and I'm doing my work on this, language, it's a, set of, it's, it's a set of symbols, or let's say words, and conversations in which words are constructed by conversations among words in the set. You know, forget about the fact that we're human beings, just look at the language itself. You know, it's a set of tra semantic transformations and so forth. So basically, I'm saying, that's a powerful idea, autocatalysis. Can we do anything with it? I mean, it's powerful. It's really talking about, um, and for example, why is it powerful? It's powerful, one, because it explains how you can get continuity through time in the face of comp continual turnover of its parts. The parts in autocatalytic systems are coming and going, utter flux, yet the pattern sort of persists through time, you know, so it explains stability, if you will. It also explains repair. You know, we injure ourselves and we get a bruise in the body and you just, without going to the doctor, it'll heal itself. Why? Because we're an, auto, we're an autocatalytic system. You know, damage will be, re you take away a chunk of, a uh, handful of nodes from an autocatalytic network and the rest of the network will busily reconstruct the missing pieces to sort of, so it has tremendous uh, repair uh, sort of qualities. That's why it's a sort of a powerful idea, just like, you know, human systems might also have this. So I got really uh, interested in this idea of autocatalysis. Um, just a couple of points. Uh, I already mentioned these metaphors down here, but um, it requires a little bit of a twist in your understanding of what a network is. I, a twist that we, that's good, actually, but a network in this view is not a pipe you know, it's not just transmitting bits, it's a sequence of transformations. Like a chemical reaction network is a network in the sense of A causes B causes C. It's not that A is passed through three nodes, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation network, not a, not a pipes-oriented network. And 
you know, I'm not opposed to the diffusion pipes oriented view. That's very useful for different purposes. But for the questions of emergence, I think this uh, transformational view of what a network is is more powerful uh, foundation. And we could, you know, Leontief measured this sort of stuff for the economy. It's not like it can't be done. For people done it a long time ago. Um, there are three types of autocatalysis in the book. Maybe I don't go too much into this because I just mentioned it. Uh, there are three types of autocatalysis in the book. You know, production autocatalysis, which is all about the reproduction of material products, physical computers, things of this this sort of in, in, an, in an ecology. There's us, the third part we care about by, that's what I call production autocatalysis. Biographical autocatalysis is this part about constructing uh, who we are. And linguistic autocatalysis is all about uh, language and um, you know the, the topic of culture came up and so forth this is not all of the culture but this is what I mean by culture basically the the reconstruction of language uh, sort of through drive semantic networks Paul McLean stuff and, and you which you that's linguistic auto autocatalysis um, so that's half that explains life or the origins of life that explains uh, stability that explains repair uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't answer by itself Darwin's question either about the origin of species, because I don't really have novelty here. A good autocatalytic system will just keep going until it runs out of gas. You know, it won't, it won't emerge, it won't switch to some other autocatalysis. So that's why this second part is actually uh, equally important. You need multiple networks uh, to, to really close the loop and generate novelty out of autocatalysis. And, um, Maybe before going in this, I'll just explain. Yeah, there we go. There's, there's multiple networks. This is how a network analyst like me and Victor see the world. You know, you see China, this is China, you know, except, you know, so there's, there's economic networks. There's an economic sphere, or you could call it a field, or you could call it a domain, or whatever you want to call it, but there's an economic area in which there are firms. What's a firm? It's a partnership, maybe? A relationship, partnership, that's uh, formed form between the people. They do business. What's business? The dotted line. They do trading products to other companies, you know, and and they have a a legal status, a name. Okay, so that's production autocatalysis, biographical autocatalysis, linguistic autocatalysis. You know, so the three types of autocatalyses go, go together to comprise the economic domain. But of course, all, China is not in Florence. They're not just the market. They're also family systems, you know. But family systems could be understood in exactly this way with exactly the same autocatalysis uh, theoretical foundations. You know, you could have uh, a family of, if this is, uh, I, I, this is, I'm going to use uh, male female language because, you know, I'm in a patrilineage society. The families are defined by male descent, not by female. So a family would be, here's a father, grandfather, father, two, two sons. That could be a family in the sense of like a partnership. But they, they trade with other families. What's trade called? Trade's called wives. You know, they're shipping wives from one uh, sort of family to another. And they got legitimacy. They got, they got a name. Of course, notice here, this is has no name. There are a lot of uh, people that are sleeping around producing babies, but they're not the Paget family, you know, because they're just illegitimate. But they're still part of the network, so they have no circle. So there's, a, you know, this is also the, the family sphere is also a composition of production autocatalysis, uh, biographical autocatalysis, linguistic auto, and you know, political. You know, here's a, there's a political alliance. Dotted lines are deals. I have no circles down there because uh, political. Organizations are utterly illegal in Florence. You know, it's a conspiracy, it's a faction, and so forth. So, you know, there's tremendous non-recognition of their legitimacy of opposition and so forth. But if you had a modern day sector, you could have draw circles, which means the legitimacy. So this is just a way of ex putting the, what I'm talking about into a, a format that you can see how this relates to data, you know? And indeed, you know, in my, in my data, uh, set. This is a relational database. You know, I have 120 tables, uh, and I've, I've connected it all by IDs. And what's an ID? An ID is a, is a statement that this 
uh, politician is the same as this father is the same as this businessman. So, you know, vertical lines are the composition of roles, which are people. Okay? And so, you know, I won't go into it, but if, you know, big data, well, I'm not so big, but 60,000 people, 1,700 family genealogies, and, and marriage data, you know, political data, economic data, you can all put it into uh, an access or SQL or something sort of database and, and link it up in a way that's just precise. Not, this is not a metaphor. It precisely is the way it is linked up uh, in, the, in the database. So what do I want to do? So all I've done now is I've just defined autocatalysis. I've moved to multiple networks saying, okay, actually there's quite a few of these autocatalysis. It's not just one network. It's actually quite a few of these things that are layered on top of each other linked by the fact that people... Uh, go by uh, different rules. And I'll, I'll throw in a little uh, jab, and maybe I'll get resistance on this point, and that's fine. But, you know, I, I like to think of uh, goals not as attached to people, but as attached to roles. What do I mean by that? Well, like, here's Cosimo de' Medici as a banker. Here's Cosimo de' Medici as a father. Here's Cosimo de' Medici as a politician. Is Cosimo de' Medici a purposive actor? You're damn right. But on the other hand, what's his, what are his goals? Well, he's interested in profit up here, and he's in, maybe interested in status down here, maybe he's interested in power down here. There are different goals associated with different roles, so the, the idea of profit is not a feature of Cosimo, it's a feature of Cosimo uh, as banker. Are they consistent? Can you draw a utility function that puts it all together? Well, that just sort of depends upon how contradictory these things are. If they're, if they're, if they're all rank ordered in the same way, then of course you can write a meta equation and act as if you're doing a global maximization. But if they're actually contradictory, you know, and they're doing one thing this way and another thing this way and another thing this way, you can easily generate cycles of behavior, cycles of things which, of course, violate the von Neumann-Morgenstern axioms. So you don't even have, you can't even draw a utility function that that particular case. So the whole idea of uh, uh, methodological individualism in the sense of maximizing a uh, utility function is gone, you know, if you have contradiction uh, among these things, because then you've got cycles and no, no consistent curve to draw. So that's a sort of a footnote. That you, I could get argument, and that's fine. So this is the setup. The question is, how do you get from this to novelty? The goal is novelty, you know? Autocatalysis is tool number one. Multiple networks is tool number two. How do you get the payoff, which is, uh, which is uh, novelty? Well, um, let me explain this distinction we make between innovation and invention. That'll be step one, halfway to an answer, but not the full answer. We define innovation as uh, basically, um, we, we, I shouldn't say we define, we see in our cases inductively uh, innovation as sort of vertical movements on this thing, you know? Cosmo's bank in trouble. What am I going to do? Well, what he's going to do is going to search through this network space to find new ideas. You know, this is totally like what Ron Burt would have said, you know? What, what does he look? He looks to see how he behaves as a father. Well, let me try to run my bank as a family. That's an idea. It may or may not work, but it's an idea. Let me try to write, run my firm as a patron-client network. Uh, or maybe I can run my idea as my brother's patron client <laughs> network, you know? Basically search through the space, one step, two steps, three steps, and, and find. So this network from an idea generation point of view is what uh, sometimes called the topology of the possible, the set of ideas that are available to you in, in considering changes. You know, and, and, I, and we see in our, uh, in our uh, systems, our cases, people doing this all the time. You know, so it's not like there's some brand new moment we're all innovation. No, people are constantly moving ideas up and down this thing. I do ideas are dime a dozen. They're happening all the time. Experiments, you know, it's not random experiments. It's directed experiments by this structure. But it's happening constantly. It's like a quantum flux almost. So where do you get real change? Innovation. Well, real change, innovation, invention, is when it's not just a new idea for your bag, but that, uh, that thing percolates and reorganizes the whole autocatalytic system in which you're in. So it jumps from here to here and here and here and here, and all of a sudden you've got a new diagram, a new network diagram, which has changed the, whole, the autocatalytic network. So innovation is changing the node. Invention is changing the network in which the node is being reproduced. 
You know, it's not just changing a new widget, it's changing, it's creating a new industry of uh, ecology uh, of, the, of this sort of thing. So the whole question about this thing is the percolation. You know, how, how, is, how, how vulnerable are systems to being perturbed, being reorganized, and how do things percolate around once some uh, new idea sort of comes along? So that's stage one. Stage two is, uh, you know, the, we have, I think, eight mechanisms that our cases uh, have uncovered, you know, I won't have time to do it, but things called transposition and refunctionality, things called uh, anchoring diversity, things called, I can't even remember, can remember them, purge and mobilization, my old friend, robust action, multivocality, and then uh, there, there's a variety of uh, mechanisms that we have inductive, not derived, inductively found in our cases, which really show where this sort of tipping, where this sort of tipping thing comes from. And, and all these mechanisms, which I'm just waving my hands, please read the book, all have to do with uh, not, not just this micro stuff, not just this micro percolation, but, you know, m sort of macro things which take a hunk of this network and shove it down into this hunk of this network. You know, like uh, transposition refunctionality, for example, is when, you know, there was a, uh, a whole set of guildsmen who, who ran business a certain way, and they, because of the Chompy Revolt, which is a political event having nothing to do with economics, they were yanked up into the city council and became politicized. Then they were shoved out to London. You know, this is not anything that they did. It wasn't these people at Meetup. It was some macro, you know, revolution that sort of moved chunks of the network around from one place to another. And so, it, you know, it's this cross-network rewiring, if you want to call it that. You know, that is... Uh, in every case we have, you know, so the partnership system, this great economic invention, was an unintended consequence of the Chompy Revolt. What's the Chompy Revolt? Well, it's just Marxist world guys running around burning houses. Ah, so, the, you know, the Marxist Revolt led to the economic innovation, sort of the bigger version of what you were talking about, you know, this sort of thing. But what's really going on there is a chunk of this gone into a chunk of that, which then percolates in a way, you know, you've got a new set of nodes and, a, you know, if, it, if nothing happened, if it were just the old system reproducing itself, that, that happens a lot. It just means a failed effort to do invention, you know, but, but if the new nodes get incorporated in some way and the old nodes and, and cause a, a switching, a tipping uh, of networks, then, uh, then that's, and so, you know, read the book, there are, there are a lot of cases about this sort of thing, but every case, uh, you know, from Mao to Stalin, to Bismarck, you know, is, is, is interpreted in our analysis of Silicon Valley in this sort of mode, you know. There's autocatalysis. Actually, that's a complicated overlay of a, of a lot of different autocatalyses. You know, they layer on top of each other. The, the real action in explaining novelty is looking at cross-domain mappings, not just economics or not just political politics or not just kinship, but how do they sort of win through each other, you know, uh, through in a micro way or in a macro sort of uh, type of way. Okay. I start with you. Well, I mean, I've come across this work. I really liked it. Um, we read it. Past tense? No, no, no. I really liked it. No, I read it you know, last year. But, uh, you know, let's see. First and foremost, um, you know, in your move from the physical world metaphors to the social world, and that's what you and Woody are mainly interested in, right? Um, you know, there seems to be, uh, I, well, let me ask you, are you using this as a, it's not a heuristic device, it's not a metaphor, it's not a identification uh, exercise, but it's actually somewhat of, I mean, it's a, it's a full-blown causal argument, right? It's a model that causally explains the rise of innovations in novelty. So oh, one could theoretically, you, you do it nicely in, in particular chapters, use historical cases to exemplify it. But one could use current day methods, quantitative methods, to somehow capture this. And that's what you're going to say is full, as a causal argument, argument yeah. right? Yes. I mean, of course, it is a metaphor, and of course, it is an inspiration. And all of, right. it, it's all of the above list of things. Right. But including that list, yes, is a, is a predictive causal argument. But I have to say that what is prediction? You know, 
I think there's a huge difference between a physicist's notion of prediction and a biologist's notion of prediction. You know, physicists want point, you know, point equilibrium typically, or you know, if you're if you're sophisticated like Peyton, you want to predict the whole distribution. That's not a point equilibrium anymore. That's something fancier. But you know, just to be, you want a thing that's boom. You know, that's that's a, a biologist. On the other hand, you know, I, I always uh, go back to Darwin. Darwin uh, was not Spencer. Darwin was not a teleologist, you know, that the whole purpose of evolution is to create the end product, right? Me, you know, that, that was not so sort of Darwin. Darwin used to draw pictures of a branching bush, you know? This leads to this, this leads to this, and, you know, all his notebooks are full of this branching bush uh, sort of framework. And he basically wants to, un Darwin would have said, which is, of course, increasing diversification, not, not convergence to the optimum, but you know, increasing diver diversification of ecologies, that's what Darwin uh, was, was really all about. So this is what I, def I, I, I say yes, but I want to make sure that you understand that what I define prediction as are the, is the trajectory space. These are the four ways China could have gone under Deng Xiaoping. Not five, not eight, not twelve, but not one either. It wasn't predetermined. You know, there were the four. And prediction is to specify, okay, these are the four. In other words, here's, a, here's an autocatalytic network, uh, and here's how it could tip. It could tip this way into a new one basin attraction, or, you know, multiple equilibria. It's not, not, a, not such a foreign idea. You know, there, there, there are these multiple uh, basins of attraction that systems are vulnerable to. And, you know, and, and it's not predetermined. You know, it really mattered what Deng Xiaoping did, you know, to, to tip this thing. And then even then it went beyond his control, as, as uh, Victor just said. I mean, it went way further than Deng wanted, you know. But nonetheless, this was one of the four options. So, yeah, understanding the trajectory space, as long as you agree with that, then yes, I, I'm in favor of this as a cult of Um You were talking about uh, phenotypes. And, and you say, well, you know, it's, uh, genes is not really action, but we act, there's actually much more attention to the phenotype. Uh, I would agree with you. However, uh, the question is, what is the phenotype in this case? Uh, so the, when you say in the short run, it's the actors that uh, uh, create the show. In the long run, the show creates uh, the actors. Then. Uh, uh, is the actor now the phenotype? Because I, on the whole, I see that uh, uh, you go a little bit cavalierly over the, the what do we need to know about the individual as an actor that all these things happen. So if you take the phenotype very seriously, so now we go back to the micro-macro uh, idea and you say both are important. And of course, your story is mostly about the, the, the network world, while the question is, uh, what uh, could we have some advantage from paying more or more attention to the phenotype that's involved in this, in terms of uh, an actor that, with regard to the uh, uh, theory, that was the behavioral theory we have about the actor is more stable than as a phenotype than as an actor. So that, that indeed uh, over over time actors change a great deal, but certain phenotypical parts of the actor <coughs> change a lot slower. So that uh, our theory about how human nature operates. Is, is a lot s slower in changing than uh, the actors in history are changing. And I see a lot of actors in history changing, but I don't see in, in your thing much attention to, uh, to this micro-micro part of, uh, of course, people then uh, 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 go from one domain to another to get an idea on how to, how to solve it, yet I, of course, don't see very much about, uh, let's say, what do we know about self-regulating uh, mechanisms, uh, human mechanisms, with regard to 
uh, being influenced from one sphere to uh, to another sphere. That I find, of course, a very strong part of your work that uh, is that influence. But if you look at the more at the uh, nitty gritty of that, the question is uh, what's happening there, and could we learn something from uh, paying more attention to the phenotype? Good question. Uh, tough question. Um, again, you know, everything has to be predicated on time scale. So, you know, I'm, things are utterly stable at the micro level on a short term time scale. So, to enter into my game, we're talking about biographies in light force uh, at level 30 year for 30, 50 year time frames. You know, and so, uh, the, so empirically, question number one is how stable are we over 30, 50 year time frames, you know? Uh, or are we, is well, the network in no, no, but that's what I think. We, uh, how stable are we as actors? But how stable are, uh, is human nature over these 50 years? And there, you, I think you would agree with me that there isn't much change in that. Well, no, I would disagree with that, sure. I mean, I would, I would not dis, I would not disagree with. If you mean human nature of the biological in, infrastructure, well, then no, I certainly no, also, agree. Also, in, in terms of the mental architecture and, uh, and, uh, no, but, uh, and okay, you could you have to break down actor into its components, and there are a variety of ways. To, the traditional way is, you know, preferences, uh, cognitive worldviews, values. These are the sort of typical elements of what makes an actor. So when you say stability, you're talking about stability of preferences, stability of cognitive no, worldviews, no, no, stability no, no, of no, values. No, 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 I'm not talking about content. I don't know what human nature means. Uh, uh, human nature would be the, the general uh, mechanisms on how cognitions change, how your values might change under under certain under certain cognition. Of course, of course, well, like the, learning uh, algorithms. Learning algorithms, uh, uh, sexual algorithms, changes in salient algorithms, and, and, and all. Uh, of course, okay. the content will change over time. Well, all I'm saying is, you know, I really, really strongly disagree. I, I, don't, I hate words like human nature, absolutely. Uh, it doesn't mean that I, I think everything changes in flux. There are slow changing things and fast changing things. And, you know, there are different time scales of change. But the idea of eternal non change. It, I, uh, you uh, didn't hear uh, me say no way. eternal. I said a much slower change. There are in slower one changes. Than in the other. That's what sure. I'm saying. And that makes a difference with regard to the tools we have. Sure. But I, but I regard that as an empirical, not a theoretical question. You know, it's up to us to collect the data and show what is slow change, fast change. All systems, even in the kinship, even the family, child rearing, you know, child rearing, this would be a classic slow changing sort of thing. It changed pretty quickly in our time. Uh, so everything changes and they have different speeds and so forth. So I, I take your point seriously, but I, I, I turn it into an empirical question, you know, just measure. Some, sometime, even the most basic, slow-moving, human nature things change pretty quickly. This Sometimes. Is, okay. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.